My name is Lydia Lunch, and I'm a confrontational performance artist, although I like neither the term performance nor artist, because basically I'm a confrontationalist. I consider myself a journalist and a hysterian of our times. I knew that was my path since I was probably, well, 12 years old for sure, when I had started writing um, in Rochester, New York. I started writing inspired by uh, Hubert Selby, Henry Miller, Marquis de Sade, Genet, Foucault. Um, and I knew that amongst this brood, um, I felt there wasn't an equal feminine voice, which does not mean there were not female writers, but I didn't find a woman writer who spoke in a language that is, well, was as blunt as I needed to hear because, because I was already in a very blunt existence. So I knew from the age of 12 that I had a calling to do something with language, with words. I needed to tell um, my version of reality according to how I lived it because I felt that's what Henry Miller and Hubert Selby and Genet did. And those books were so important to me. I mean, the way that people uh, gravitate towards music at an early age and whatever saved by music, well, well, literature saved me. And I don't know how I found these books at the age of 12 in a used bookstore in upstate New York. I've got no idea. But these books, and probably Last Exit to Brooklyn, it was just an eye-catching graphic cover. Um, nobody told me about them. I don't know how I happened upon them, but one led to the other, led to the other. And, um, you know, and by that point, by the age of 12, I already knew I was searching for something more that would, than what existed in my backyard. Although not to put down, because Rochester actually was very interesting at that point. Um, a lot of music came there. So, I mean, after literature, of course, music followed the classics that everyone, you know, the Stooges, the Velvet Underground, David Bowie. Um, David Bowie was very impressive to me, and I never really talk about him, and mainly because he was the first real changeling. And I think, because I'm a musical schizophrenic, I think that just watching Bowie's progression, and the fact that also that he was one of the first to um, disavow his gender. You know, they, he was like, you, that was very important glam rock for that, as somebody who always felt ill-defined by my specific gender from a very early age, I felt. Um, you know, I was born with a, a twin brother who died in the womb, and I always thought I consumed him, and therefore I feel both very male and very female. I think most of us are if we aren't segregated as children, if we aren't boxed into being the accepted behavior patterns that our parents would like to mold us into, if you rebel against that. And glam rock was great for rebelling against that. You know, the sexiest guys were dressed as girls, you know, come on. I mean, the New York Dolls are, are why I ran away to New York the first time. So by, the, by 12, 13, 14, I was already well into literature and then music came in and there were so many great concerts in, in Rochester, New York for some reason. I mean, even Mick Ronson, David Bowie's guitar player, spent time there. There was a place called the House of Guitars that was run by criminals who stole guitars to open a store. They were kind of like the Lou Reed of upstate New York, Armin Schraubach, and I would go in there every weekend begging to be on their ridiculous, like pre-crazy Eddie commercials and they would just always have the same response. <laughs> I mean, at 13, I already I had like black cherry slick back hair, no eyebrows, wet look dress, rosary beads. This is 1973, goth was not yet invented. Um, hanging out in graveyards. And I did have my first taste of publicity by going to the House Guitars and insisting they never accepted me. Um, because a photographer saw me and my girlfriend, who was another like 12 or 13 year old, and we were going to concerts all the time, dressing pre-goth. And a photographer, very straight dude, saw us in house guitars and asked to take our picture, and he did, and he put him up at the Rochester Institute of Technology and immediately caused an uproar, like, oh, get those horrible girls in the graveyard off the wall, like, yes, anti-popularity. Uh, I knew my path was set then. I mean, like, the first sign of protest against my existence thoroughly encouraged me to go forward with what I knew I had to do. I just said, oh, yeah, negative attention. That's what I'm after. So um, with the same girl, uh, who I'd go to concerts with, lived across the street from me. Her father actually gave us a, a lift to the Greyhound in the middle of the night so I could run away from home with her at the age of 14 and go to New York City. Oh, her, so I was wondering if your parents, like, okayed it, or were they, like... I know, I snuck out my basement window. Oh, okay. Disappeared in the middle of the night, didn't tell them where I was going, ended up on Bleak Grim McDougal. My girlfriend's cousin was a pot dealer. She wasn't too happy with us being there, but we got the taste of what we needed to taste. And New York was very bleak in those days. I mean, the early 70s in New York, I mean, this is 73. Um, you know, McDougal Street was a ghost town. There was nothing between, McDougal, Bleaker Street was a ghost town, nothing between McDougal and CBGB's, which was just like getting started down there. there was, it was a ghost town. It was very dark. Um, the scene was very dark. It was when disco, really insidious, nasty discos were around New York, really dangerous spots. Um, it was a bleak period. I loved it. 
I'm like, I'm gonna go get some money and come back. So I knew that as a 14 year old, I had to be there, but I knew I, there's no way without really being violated at that age that I could make any money or find a way to figure it out. So I went back and I, I got my only real job in my life as a maid in upstate New York, lied about my age, ripped off everybody I could, stole as much money as possible, worked hard, took the money, ran away to New York, I guess 16, 17, dropped out of school. I dropped out of school in the 10th grade, which is why I love going to universities. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, because my, I had an English teacher who was a hippie and I, I refused to read John Steinbeck and other crap American classics. Like I would already, my, my, my literature, my home library was already far, you know, beyond that. I'm like, I'm not gonna read these fairy tales by John Steinbeck. I'll write stories, I won't read them. And she said, you know what? Write the stories, but you don't belong here. And it would probably be best if you did get out. And I'm like, thank you, see ya. And I just walked out the door and that was it. And then made my plans to go to New York because that's, I knew where, that's where I had to be. But in my, uh, my goals in going to New York, I mean, were, I knew I had to do something with, with words, I mean, but there was no word-based art at that point. It was past beat, it was past, you know, Patti Smith, which might have inspired me at 14, was by now to me really boring and too rock and roll and too traditional. I mean, I had a few intentions. One was to, everything that had inspired me was too traditional and had to be destroyed. And I, I kind of meant that seriously. But I had to invent something that was the antithesis of everything that inspired me because it was too traditional. But I wanted to do something because I was already, I thought, a word-based word -based artist. What's kind of bizarre is that my first group, Teenage Jesus and the Jerks, half the music was instrumental. But the titles were important. So even the titles, and even now when I do a photograph, you know, uh, the titles are important because every word matters to me. Not that you have to study every word, but words yeah. matter to me because they impacted me. They saved my life. Literature used to save people's lives before they became lazy and just started listening to music much easier. Um, so when I get to New York, that, the format, which was, you know, now this is, you know, post-glam, uh, the first group I think I saw, I, I, mean, I immediately went to this rock club that I had read about in like, you know, some of the rock magazines. There was a band playing on stage. I picked the weakest looking one, the lead singer, attached myself to him, said I needed a place to stay. I lived a few blocks away in Chelsea, and, they, and he took me in. And Kitty Bruce, Lenny Bruce's daughter, was moving out, and I moved into her bed. And that just, to me, seemed absolutely fucking right. And, uh, of course, they didn't like it that I wasn't, you know, going to be the girlfriend of the dumb lead singer. But, I mean, I was in. Now they weren't going to kick me out. I was in then. Uh, was right around the corner from Texas, Kansas City. And I think Suicide was, well, they were my first friends, Suicide. They might have been the first concert I saw there. And I just knew that was, that was it, you know. That defied every tradition. Um, they are still, to this day, one of my biggest inspirations. I was very thrilled this year when I was asked, because Alan Vega was sick, to do a, to, to cover, to, to reenact Alan Vega's songs in Lyon at, a, at a, an Electro Fest with Mark Hurtado, a guy who's been working with him. So I got to do, not all my favorite songs, but and it also Retrovirus, my band now, we do Frankie Teardrops. I just think they're so psychodynamically important and broke so many traditions. Um, and they kind of adopted me at that point. We give me vitamins. Oh. Yeah. Niacin flushes. I was younger than Martin Rev's son. Yeah. So, um, you know, but, but again, so I'm there and word based stuff, it's not really. So I knew I had to get in somehow. I had to start doing something. And actually, the first band that really, that, that, I mean, I saw Suicide, but the band that impressed upon me that I needed to start a band was the band Mars, which were also on No New York, because that was psychosis brought to the stage. And I think what defines. Um, no Wave, or especially New York music at that time from British punk rock, which, you know, I had nothing to do with punk. I never did. I thought it was boring and ridiculous. I always did. To me, it was just too redundant. Um, although the, my first music was some of the most minimalist, you know, music, but there's a difference between being minimal and, and well, I just thought punk rock was just, chord progressions were, 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 were ridiculous. It was just silly to me. I mean, it was a good movement for rejects to all look the same, come together and make a political statement there. But in New York, none of us looked the same. We didn't sound the same. We were all nuts. It was a very different atmosphere. It was a very bleak period. It was bleak in, in the UK, too. But the New York state of mind at that period was, for some reason, unlike any other, because it was so dangerous. Um, we lived in very dangerous conditions. New York was a bomb zone at that point. It was like, Be I, I called it Beirut on the Hudson. Um, I lived between two abandoned buildings, garbage piles six feet high. Um, my first apartment, $75 a month on 12th Street. But, you know, and, and one block away is, and I didn't know him yet, is Thurston Moore and is Richard Kern and is a lot of other people just living in a very condensed situation, all attracted to, um, 
this bankrupted, corrupted, broken place because we were pretty much broken and probably had been corrupted as well. And what attracted me even as a young criminal mindset to New York was I felt, oh, I could get away with a lot of shit here. <laughs> Nobody's gonna know. That was very attractive to me. Um, I would prefer to consider myself a con artist than just an artist. Uh, so I just began doing music, and I, mean, uh, my, I already was musically schizophrenic because I had my band Teenage Jesus and the Jerks, which just sounds like a punch in your face, with a shrill tantrum thrown on top of it. But at the same time, I had another group called Beirut Slump, which is, to me, horror, horrorcore. I think it might have been the only horrorcore band, I don't know. Um, which I just wrote the music, played the guitar, and you know, somebody else sang all the lyrics were from bums on the subway, homeless people, as we like to call them. And um, we rehearsed for about a year and played three times, and then at the last performance, a homeless man got up and started singing, so we knew that, was, that we wasn't gonna get any better, and we disbanded Beirut Slump. Um, and Teenage Jesus kept going for a little while because I just felt music that ugly, that precise, that brutal. It had to be pounded into the public's face. But then the point was made. The point was made. And, uh, time to go on. So, I mean, I was already contradicting what had come before, and the next step to me was that then this not very interesting kind of jazzy surf pop group asked me, Eight Eyed Spy, to join them, and I found most of the music kind of, I don't know, I didn't like the way it was complex, because it wasn't that, it, it annoyed me, and I annoyed them, because they always wanted me to sing, and I'm like. They're definitely more like songs than. Why sing? Yeah. I was very rebellious against any note other than the one I like to hit at any given time. Um, but I really liked the bass player, George Scott. He, uh, he had great energy, and so did the drummer, Jim Clavunas. I mean, there were just elements of it. I, it was just a bit too, to me it was like West Coast jazz in the worst sense, and just, that's not even what it was. But it was, it was good for a while, and then it started to become really popular, and I found that really annoying. I didn't like the look in people's eyes. I didn't like the, oh. It's like, don't fucking fawn over me. It really annoyed me, and at the height of its popularity, I just said, I quit, I didn't like it. And also the music was just not, re basically there was one song I really liked, and Retrovirus just, just recorded it two weeks ago, started doing it, and it's some of the most abstract song that Eight Spy had. But anyway, to keep myself amused, at the same time I started recording my album, Queen of Siam. So I mean, already within this like three year period, um, and it, thanks to Michael Zilka, he had Z Records. He really encouraged that. He saw, he understood when I said I wanted to make a record that was like nursery rhymes and big band. I, I was doing a lot of second holes and whiskeys and watching cartoons a lot, and that kind of came, made sense at the time. Um, I was always just doing what I thought needed to be done at the time. I mean, I'm a conceptualist, so what comes first is always the concept, and then the collaborators. So when people say, oh, you've worked with so many people. Well, I didn't just choose to work with them because of who they were. I chose to work with them because I had a concept, and they were the perfect participants and collaborators. Um, I'm very grateful for everybody I've ever worked with, and I think it was just natural for me to, to, to choose the right people for the projects. Um, and, and I always knew that the project's goal was, you have an idea, you document it, maybe you do some tours, maybe you don't, and then you go on, because what's the point? I could never understand that, I mean, there was, a, there was it's a concept, it has a limited lifespan. Once you make the point, as, as well, as, you know, once you batter the point in, once you have exhausted the point, and you have made the issue very clear, and you have exercised whatever needs to get out of your head, next, yeah, you know, next. And, um, Queen of Siam was interesting because Michael Zilke really understood what I was trying to do and he was able to actually get to a big band leader who I absolutely hated how he bastardized his music and I brought, well one of my favorite musicians of all time was Robert Quine who was with Richard Hell and the Voidoids. I think I was his first fan, this is how I see it anyway, I think after the Voivod's first show I ran up to Robert Quine and said, you are God and since I was his first fan he, you know, when was so cute, he, uh, he adopted me. He always carried a screwdriver in his pocket that made me like him either, even more. <laughs> he was very helpful to me. I mean, he really understood Teenage Jesus, and as one of the, to me, greatest guitar players, that he got what I was trying to do was just, it was very encouraging. It was always the weird old men that got me, like the, the ones that were, my, although they were all 10 years older than me, and they just ran from me screaming. They couldn't get it. They didn't, they thought I was, well, I was a teenage terrorist. I was terrorizing them, like, wanted to do shit. Um, so, I mean, it just, I mean, from there on, I, I, the pattern had already been established. I, I knew that that's what I was going to do. I was continue to, whatever concept, whatever aspect 
of my emotional disability at the time needed to be exercised, it had to come out in music and then eventually word. And by now it's like 82. And I think that's, I'm not sure, but I think that's when 82, 84 is when I began doing spoken word, when I just said, all right, that's enough with the fucking music. We have to get to the point. And the point is this. And one of the first spoken word shows I did was called Daddy Dearest, because that was the fucking point. Yeah. And, um, you know, people were pretty shocked with that performance because, well, I'm really good at alligator tears, you know, I, I, I really like to wring emotion out of people because they need to be wrung out. I mean, that's the point. This is psychodrama. Uh, it's public psychotherapy. And people always were kind of shocked that that was one of the first things I came out with, but that was the fucking point. That was why I was creating it. And I wasn't only speaking, as most great writers are not only speaking for themselves, they are trying to find that universal wound. And you first have to really dig into it until it's so festered and poisonous that it's gonna kill you if you don't cauterize. And I think that was, once I opened my mouth for spoken word, there was no fucking shutting me up. I'm like, yeah. And it was not a popular format, let me assure you. It was, there would be very short sets, mainly 10 minutes. I started organizing and curating events because I, it was, who else was gonna do it? So I started putting nights on at the Pyramid and other places and would do very short sets because it's all people could handle. I mean, 10 minute maximum, because it, especially my style, like Teenage Jesus, was such an intense hysterical harangue. I mean, it was, it was insanity. I look at some of my early performances, and I'm just like, and I wasn't shot in the face. <laughs> How did I get away with it? I mean, I had to I could get away with it. What are you gonna do to fucking stop me? Yeah. It had to be said. And you know, and a lot of it was very considered male bashing, racist, sexist. I was using the language of the enemy to try to exercise my own demonic possession. Um, people, there had been no precedent for that kind of aggressive spoken word before. It just didn't exist. I, I don't, I don't still think it doesn't exist. Um, but, but like with the music, when you start at such a hysterical level, I mean, you can't go more hysterical. You had to, I had to find a way to finesse it to sophisticate it into a way, at least beginning more seductively, so you can pull them in. I mean, it's, you know, a kiss before kill. <laughs> and you know, that took a while just for me to bring my own hysteria down. And especially if you know it's only, you got 10 minutes, you're gonna go in and you're gonna fucking start battering. It's gotta be said. Um, and what was amazing to me is there were a lot more places at that time to do spoken word, I think, than there are now. I mean, I went to Europe a lot. I brought Hubert Selby to, to Europe and Henry Rollins. And, uh, you know, we toured together. And it was interesting because at the same time, basically, Henry Rollins and Jello Biafra, Xen Surbank, and myself in different places started pretty much doing a very similar thing. Mm -hmm. I, I never I did any shows with Jello Biafra because three hours, any man talking is enough to drive. <laughs> I mean, it's just like... Can I do 10 minutes and you can do three hours? But I think it's important what Jello Biafra has to say. I mean, he's still haranguing the political issues. He's still hilarious. I mean, so what if I, if I don't have three hours to dedicate to his cause, there's a lot of kids that need to hear what he has to say. And he's relentless. Um, and it's the same for the other people I mentioned, that, that we are still, not that there isn't, of course, poet, you know, slam poetry and a lot of styles came up after that, but the spoken word, which is what I call what we do, um, there's not that many more people doing it, and, and most of us are still doing it. I think, I think that's really important. I just think it's something that, you know, when you are driven to do that, I mean, to me, that is my highest duty. Now, the only reason I do something like last night is when I, when I started going more to Europe and dealing, of course, in English, but, but wanting to get my spoken word, because I think I am much, I am better understood in Europe I just came from South America, very well understood there. But I had to, because I tried to do what I do with translations or backup, female backup doing like half translations, passing out, trans people don't want to be interrupted. Even if they don't know what I'm saying, they'd rather just have the emotional bombast. So then I started bringing in images and music to make it a little bit more like this universe that people could just dissolve into. You don't have to hear every word I'm saying. You don't need to know the entire context of every piece. You know, it's, it's the emotional impact. It's, it's a form of exorcism, um, and it's just the beauty of language used as an assaultive weapon and as a salve. That's what's most attractive to me about any kind of music or, or art at all, is, is when it has the ability to both batter you and then baby you, you know, or at least address the baby in you that has been battered. That's really important. I mean, especially as a, as a so-called woman. In, yeah, and you said in, in, well, and you just said in Europe, um, people are more receptive to spoken word. 
Uh, they read more. They still yeah. have time to read, but also, I mean, they're more receptive to not pigeonholing people. They don't need to put you in a neat category in order to place you in some place to perform. They're just more generous. They, they come with more allowance. They're, they're more open, in a sense. Um, but here you're... Um I don't even want to say it, but I've read a, you're like a cultural icon. Well, I mean, to you, I may be a cultural yeah. icon. I mean, basically, I'm pretty much left out of a lot of discussion, but that's fine. I never, I didn't start doing what I do. I mean, I always knew I was, uh, look, my, one of the first songs I wrote was called Popularity is So Boring. I did not do this to become popular or anyone's cultural icon. I mean, I did this because it had to be done, and I saw the hole in literature that existed that I had to fill at a some bizarre prehistoric duty to one of the original art forms, which is the word. I mean, there was a hole that I needed to fill, and I just I just felt that calling, I felt that duty. Um, you know, if somebody calls you, it's not like I sit here and think, I'm a cultural, I, you know what, I, I do the work I'm meant to do. Um, I'm a journalist, I prefer that term because it doesn't say anything. I'm a hysterian. Those other words, they're, they're so loaded with bullshit that it, it just, cultural icon to who? Well, the marginalized, the misrepresented, you know, the insecure, the shy, the battered, the abused, the outcast, the weirdos, thank you. Do embrace me because I embrace you back with no judgment. Yeah. So, but I mean, you know, I'm down there talking to people, hugging people. I mean, I'm just like everybody else, only with a bigger fucking mouth. <laughs> Better vocabulary. Um, a little bolder okay. than most. Yeah. But I want to be your mouth. Yes. That's now that's I wanna you be are. your mouth. You see? <laughs> yeah. Um, Harlan Ellison is the one who said I have a mouth, but I, I have a I have no mouth to scream with. I will be the mouth that screams. Um. Well, I've heard, I have read you've called yourself a humanist rather than a feminist, and then. I ask these type of questions because yeah, yeah. this person you have to. feminist archive. Well, again, it's, um, a, it's another word that is so loaded with misconceptions. Yes. It's so generic. It's like saying potato, mustard, feminist. What does that mean? Like Andrea Dworkin? Like Camille Paglia? Like Naomi Wolf? I mean, who are we referencing here? I say humanist because I think the whole fucking human race is under great duress now, and especially the individuals. I guess I'm an individualist. I want to save the individual. And I have to say humanist because I picked on men for so fucking long, and that's why I have to do a piece like last night which I do understand the need to murder and slaughter because it is little boys that are battered and castrated. And that's why we are in the situation we are now. Yeah. Because that is genetic, that is historical, that goes on, that's familial, that is the problem within the nuclear and other kinds of family where there is a male figurehead and we don't talk about what happens and we sexually segregate children and we, and we breed, especially in this country, insecure, um, unsatisfied, lonely, people who have access to machine guns. Mm -hmm. um, well, I was also wondering, um, you know, you said that you've collaborated with so many people, uh, filmed it like Richard Kern, Thurston Moore, just Nick Cave, um, and it's just, you know, other women that I'm interviewing, these men wanted to work with you. Um, and you wanted to work with them. I'm just wondering what that was like. Well, they didn't come to me. None of them came to me. Went to I went to all of them. And they all worked with you. I'm just wondering they could have said no. Yeah. Um, well, I'm just wondering well, I mean, it's not like they were the big rock stars they are now when I approached yeah. them necessarily either. I mean, you know. Just, uh, I guess, was it like a conscious effort? Did you not really... I'm just wondering. It had nothing to do with who they were until who they were fit the concept I had invented. Okay. So I'm not just picking somebody like, oh, I'd like to work with Tom Waits. Yeah. He's his own thing. He doesn't need me, and he doesn't fit anything I'm doing. So I never just said, oh, I want to work with, oh, is any sexy? Yeah. Most of them, not really. <laughs> Look good from a distance. Keep them on the stage. Nick Cave, not sexy. <sighs> and we'll talk about that later. <laughs> But I mean, no, look, let me, Nick Cave and I never agreed about one single thing in our lives. From their first yeah. conversation, he did not understand me. He does not get me. It was Roland S. Howard, mm -hmm. first of all, who I approached. And, and, and instantly upon meeting him, because he knew my music and I knew his, I'm just like, 
I am coming to work with you. And he, I think, right on our first meeting proposed, you know, Lee, Lee Hazelwood, Nancy Sinatra. So I was sold on that. Because I'd already done some songs with Eight Eyed Spy. I mean, I'd been exposed. Lee Hazelwood wasn't very popular at that time, but people knew who he was. Some people knew. Yeah. And he was really a very weird songwriter, and that fit my aesthetic. But I mean, the minute I met Roland, we, I just, you know, that was it. I just said, okay, I am moving to London, and that's it. <laughs> Let's do something, and that was it. But Nick Cave and I did not agree on one thing ever. Of course, it's really hard to agree with anyone when your main focus is on writing notes that big in a notebook like this, and you're on speed or heroin all the time. Yeah. Um, I had a lot of prejudices because I was not a junkie, which is a very weird thing. Oh, yeah. you're not that I am against drugs. I love drugs, done in the right way with the right people. Because I was never an addict or fucked up on junk, I had a lot of prejudice labeled. Like, I'm supposed to be suspect mm -hmm. <laughs> because I can handle my drugs. Because I didn't like heroin, I'm suspect. That was kind of a Nick Cave thing. Oh, I didn't... I didn't oh, yeah, a little dark, lot of dark secrets there. Yeah. It was kind of a New York thing, too, because a lot of the people I worked with there also had heroin problems. So I was the suspect one. Yeah. Here I am, keeping it all together, and I'm suspicious. Weird. Anyway. I still don't agree with Nick Cave on anything. But oh, we did write but we did write fifty one page plays turned into a very nice comic book called Asphyxiate. Yeah. Now the the artist that approached me, actually Mike Matthews, who did the illustrations for this comic that I did based on these fifty one page plays with Nick, um, he actually he would either committed suicide or, or was tossed in the Thames River not long after the comic came out. He thought that there were witches after him. I said, why would they be after you? They could be after the Queen of England. They could be after anyone. But either his paranoia or, he wouldn't, or, or his reality caused him to end up in the Thames dead. Mm -hmm. I was listening to the record we just recorded with, with, I just recorded with Weasel Walter and Retrovirus, and almost every song there are dead people on it. It kind of was kind of sad. Do you want to talk about cinema of transgression? Oh yeah. oh yeah, I mean, the, so I came to New York when I, 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 I was living in, in England for two years. I left LA. I did my project with Exene, Cervanka, Adulterers Anonymous, and Group 1313. Met Roland Howard, ran off to chase him, and they immediately left for tour, so I was left there. But um, I was there for two years. I did some shows with the birthday party, recorded with Roland, recorded my album, Honeymoon in Red. And then I uh, met Jim Thurwell. And we went back to New York together. And when I came back to New York, I guess it was 84. Was it 84, Weasel? He knows better than I do. Yeah. Sometime around there. When I came back with, with, um, with Jim Thurwell to New York, um, I was just looking for somebody, because I wanted to start doing my spoken word shows, and I wanted to start doing these short ones. And I was looking for people to do acts of um, violence, short, violent acts. And somebody suggested Richard Kern to me. So I met Richard Kern, and he was doing, uh, he'd already made some films, Goodbye 42nd Street, and I just immediately adored Richard Kern because he's so goofy, straight, and awkward. Seemingly, you know, oh, shucks, you know, he's from North Carolina, he's kind of an aw shucks kind of guy, and here he's getting like people to take their clothes off and yeah. do it, well, whatever, it's whatever you want to do. So I invited him to start doing, actually my first show at the Pyramid, Richard did a great act. Um, he was just like a CIA agent, sunglasses, and he was at the back and he comes playing really awful guitar, just so horrible, just ugh, horrible screeching sounds for like three minutes. And then his blood buddy stands up and goes, that's not how it's done, that's not how it's done, I'll show you how it's done. And he runs up to the front of the bar and cuts off his own hand. Well, fake hand. People freaked out. Yeah. So Richard and I started doing a lot of shows together because I thought little short stabs of, you know, unmitigated violence and blood were, were a good off, you know, a good balance to my bloody <laughs> stories. And uh, so then um, I had proposed to Richard, you know, to do, because I was really understanding what public psychotherapy was all about and I knew I had to, I knew I had issues that other people had too that had to be investigated because I didn't really find any literature that dealt with my um, specific sexual insanity. And I know it's common, it's not like I'm the only one. Yeah. So it was important, Richard understood me somehow completely. So we did the right side of my brain. And it's interesting because I just said, I don't know, we just shoot these vignettes and then I'll write the narration because I know what it has to say. That's kind of backwards way to do things. But Richard's eye, and he also knew that, you know, Repulsion by Polanski is one of my favorite films. And I think the right side of my brain really captures some essence of that. That was important. Um, 
and then his films submit to me and submit to me. Now, I mean, what I considered what Richard was doing with his, with his, I call him violent wallpaper films, which we would often show at concerts as well. It's just like, whatever you want to do, I'm going to turn the camera on, you do it. So people could just act out their naughty little, you know, sexy fantasies. And Richard didn't direct anything, which was great. I mean, he's just like, here we are. Do what you do. What do you want to do? And I, I just thought those films were really great because it's just no fat, no plot, no language, no dialogue. Here's some sexy weirdos just, you know, getting bloody and gooey. <laughs> Who doesn't want to see that? <laughs> like, yeah, hello, I should get a camera. Um, and so we showed them a lot and, and I just thought they were really great because it was, it was hot cinema with no, you don't have to pay attention either. I mean, you could go in and out of it. It was perfect for a club. I mean, you can't show, it's hard to show films at a club if people have to pay attention. So just put something up there that they see it, they don't, whatever. He did get kicked out of a few clubs. Whatever, we kept going. Um, it was great working with Richard. And then I, I decided, okay, so, I mean, the rights that I bring really helped me to understand because I had to admit exactly what my specific issues were. Um, and then we decided to do Fingered, which was very, it's amazing that that film is so, it just divides people. Yeah. You know, it's like, oh, frat beer party, oh, oh, misogynist, oh, oh, most feminist film ever made, oh, I'm puking. I just wanted to make a film that documented a certain kind of my insanity. Most of those incidences really happened with the person I filmed it with. And basically the whole point is in the final punchline is that, you know, the victim becomes the victimizer and you have to understand that. And you have to either, I, mean, I was always trying to, drop, to jump off the cycle of abuse that I was bred into. I wasn't always successful, but I always knew that. I mean, my goal was to like interrupt the patterns that are inherent in your genetic makeup. It doesn't mean I was successful, but I kept, that was the goal. I mean, just because you can intellectualize something doesn't mean you're emotionally ready or able to figure out a way to best correct the situation or to at least understand what your motives are. And to me, that was important. It's like, I knew what my obsessions were, but I had to dig deeper and understand, well, okay, it's great to have obsessions, but they cannot be the drive, they cannot drive you. Yeah. So once you understand exactly what it is that you really need, you can find a way to get that without it becoming like an addiction without you going into addiction. And that's why I wrote Paradoxia. And when I wrote Paradoxia, I wrote the last chapter first, which is the moral of the story, because I was already in that period. I had already um, had to disengage myself from myself. I had, I had to erase the slate. I had to um, get off my own warpath and, 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 and do some, basically be in lockdown. I had to lock myself down. And I think that's really effective. I think people should have to, I think that should be a mandatory experience for people. You're gonna go into a room by yourself and you're gonna stay there for a few months and then you're gonna come out and you're gonna tell me what's changed. You are gonna change. You are going to fucking change. Yeah. When you have only yourself and you better be creative. And if you are creative, it could be the best time of your life because there you are with yourself who should be your best lover, your best friend, your biggest supporter. And I guess that's what makes me different from most of the population and maybe that's why people are attracted to me because I am my biggest supporter. Because I never turn the knife inward. The enemies are all ever present to me and I know exactly who and what they fucking are and they're not from in here. Yeah, I definitely can't think of any other artist or performer who is really like you because you are aggressive and you just come off as confident and kind of unapologetic about yeah, everything we've done. I, can't I don't have a lot of those dumb human emotions. Yeah. I wasn't saddled with them because, because coming out of anger at a, such an early age, being just so hateful, I mean, just being violently full of hate and, and revenge and rebellion, um, that's a strong starting point. Yeah. I mean, most people that have been victimized, they, they come out like a battered dog. I came out like a barking, vicious motherfucking mutt who's gonna rip your throat out, so you better back off. And a lot of people did back off, not all. Because they know, you know, like any pit bull, yeah. likes to be petted. And um, paradoxia, that, I was looking, I'm like, what do they call it now? Memoir? Uh, I, I call it, it's a, I, I call, no, I know, it's not fiction, it's, it's a memoir. Yeah. I was just wondering, because it comes up as like all different things, so I was just wondering. It's a memoir. Memoir. It's not a novel. It's all true. Um, oh, can I ask you something just as like a fan? Oh, of course. Um, because you didn't mention it. <laughs> so, I didn't get well, that. Well, how, you know, I'm 33, so I missed all that. And I read something that you wrote about 
if you want to discover good music or good writing, you have to just do your homework. You have to go to an old bookstore and just like buy a book that you think looks cool, go to a record store, pick a record that looks good to you and like figure it out. So I mean, I discovered Lydia Lunch um, because you sang on my favorite song, youth song, you sang in Death Valley 69. And then you did it is a disappointment to my career that I am most known for singing with Sonic Youth, know, but however, whatever, thank but you. I still love Thurston Moore. Moore. It's all right. It's all right. It's all right. I, I love like Thurston 12. Moore. Now that's cool. However you come <laughs> to like me, come unto song. me, children. However you come to me. No, I mean, that's a great song. Yeah. And Thurston Moore is one of my favorite. He's one of my favorite people in the world. I love Thurston yeah. Moore. We adore each other. I mean, we're just total buddies. Yeah. Um, do you like the work that you did with Harry Cruz, though? Not really. I know, because I read that you didn't really, and I... I didn't really. As a teenager, I really... I mean, I like the concept of Harry Cruz a lot. Yeah. I just don't think the music really was, was good enough. Yeah. You know, I don't really like my guitar playing on it. I, I think it was a good idea, but, you know, it, it, sort of, it's, it, it, it suited the purpose. I mean, the idea was, of course, nobody in Europe knew who Harry Cruz was. All the songs were about a book. It was a good concept, but, mm -hmm. you know, I don't, I don't find it very successful. There were some good songs, but, I, it's, no, it's not my favorite thing. Yeah. yeah. That was my fan question. Um, let's see. I like what Harry Cruz said about Sonic Youth. Oh, they sound like everything you never wanted to hear. <laughs> oh, I didn't know that. Everything you never wanted to hear. <laughs> Something like that. Mm -hmm. Um, well, I'm trying to think. There's so much. Oh, I know. It's just ridiculous. Oh, my God. Do you want to... Have a cigarette break and come back? Yeah. yeah you How'd you know? I'm so out of the mainstream, and I always have, and I always will be. Yeah. I will not be in the mainstream. Um, and again, it's, my, it's back to my face, because people see my face, and they know I will not swallow the bullshit. Mm -hmm. You know, they know I will do nothing other than what I do, and nobody can corral that in. So I am not a popular commodity. It's not that I haven't sold out, because nobody will buy what I'm selling, because the truth is not a fucking popular commodity. Yeah. So that does not sell. That is not entertainment. That is irritainment. That is irritating entertainment. That is not popular. Now, I'm sure if I was wearing a dick under my skirt, the story could be a different one, but I don't hold that against it either. You know, there's a lot more leeway given to male performers. There just fucking is. Yes. You know, there just is. Well, that's and, why I got the okay to do this, because she was like, this has to exist somewhere. And yeah. it doesn't. Yeah. There's no collection of women doing music. Yeah. I mean, there's just like this huge gap. There's a huge gap. Yeah, and and that that is for you to fill in. Yeah. You know. I want to make academia cool. Well, it can be. Um. All right. Where are we? I just said there's so much. Well, <laughs> up to we the nineties. Oof, Jesus. Well, we kind of uh, left off before my fan questions. Oh, I, okay. We were like in the nineties. Sure. Um. Well, I don't know, do you want to talk about, um, like, why you d uh, decided to do retrovirus? Yeah, yeah, of course. Ago? Yeah, what... Well, it came about as, as, as it was a kind of a bizarre setup. Um, a friend of mine, Cesar Padilla, was writing a book on DIY t-shirts. I hate t-shirts. I never wear them. Um, but I, so I had to investigate the, the history of t-shirts to write the introduction. It was a paid gig, and why not? Um, so I investigated what, t you know, t-shirts came out of actually the British military that wanted to hide their chest hair from the queen. So then, you know, Marlon Brando, James Dean, Richard Hell, and then, of course, those mannequins for cool t-shirts, the Sex Pistols is what I call them. And uh, so anyway, this book was going everywhere. This book was in a lot of you know shops, and, and I saw it everywhere. And um, and and actually, I wrote my cookbook, The Need to Feed, because of the company that did Caesar's book, which which was a disaster for me. But the cookbook is great, The Need to Feed. But so anyway, the Los Angeles School of Design was going to have an exhibition of the T-shirts that the Caesar has that are in the book. And he asked me if I would do a performance, and I was going to try to bring my big sexy noise because that's what I was working at at the time. But it was too short notice to get work paid. It was just too complicated, so I, I just thought, well, I'm just going to do retrovirus. I'm just going to you know, do this. And I got a hold of Bob Burt first because Bob and I go way back, and, and, and Bob's great. You know, he's one of the nicest guys out there, and, and Bob has probably seen more of my shows than any man alive should have. That's what Yeah, absolutely. Right Bob is just, Bob is a, you know, a diehard idiot. That is Bob Burt of Sonic Youth. And, you know, we've been friends for a long time. So I called Bob, and I just thought, you know, I want to do something with Bob. He's, he's a great guy, and he's easy to work with. And th sometimes, you know, that's that's can be very that's important. Yeah. Um, but I think that when I work with people, 
uh, <laughs> reputation be damned because people work with me because I'm very easy to work with because I am the ultimate cheerleader because I do nothing but rah, rah, rah people. And I want to always create something that would not exist without that unique collaboration forming then at that period in time. So, and I'm very encouraging, you know, to people. I mean, that's why I can collaborate sometimes with the same people over and over again, or that's why people will work with me, because they know it's going to be... I mean, I think that inside creation, all bullshit should be exiled. So when you're working on a project, I mean, that, that's the sacred zone. That's the safety net. You want to go inside there, because the bullshit does not enter, at least in my way of creating. There's, that, that, that's where you want to be. That's, that's the fucking church, right? That is the church of creation. Creativity, bullshit be gone. So I'm very encouraging and I love, I mean, I have to work with collaborators. First of all, I'm not a musician. I need people to play the instruments. I need them to write songs. And so I, I thought of Retrovirus and I, I went back and actually Retrovirus was the intro I wrote for Thurston Moore's book on No Wave, uh, New York Underground. Okay. Um, and so then I contacted uh, Algis Kizzy, who was in Swans, because I'd worked with him before. And, and we had a list, of, Bob and I made a list of like 15 guitar players, and just like, nah. Uh, it's, it's very complicated, because although the music is pretty simple, it has very diverse, it has, um, it has to have an emotional impact. And especially if you're gonna do some Teenage Jesus songs, that eliminates a lot of people. I mean, one of my favorite fan moments, because I really don't give a shit, the applause is not what I live for, the emotional impact that I know is gonna penetrate your psyche is why I do what I do. Not that's why I discourage people, especially in spoken word, yeah. from applauding. I just don't want to hear that. Um, but one, one, I do love when I did the Teenage Jesus reunion with Thurston Moore and Jim Sculvunas, that is the Twin Towers in Building 7, yeah. as I like to call us. Um, I love it when the metal guitar players come and kiss my ass. They're like, oh my God. I just love it when metal dudes are like, oh my God, your guitar playing. Because I just laugh. I love it when Glenn Bronca, never a friend of mine, dropped to his knees backstage at the Knitting Factory and said, you are a rock star. I said, get off your fucking knees. No, I am not. And I don't need 23 guitars. I need one. Thank you very much. Um, so anyway, we had a list of guitar players. The one I, I contacted Paul Leary of the Butthole Surfers, who I had seen the Butthole Surfers. I mean, they were friends of mine for a long time. I love Paul Leary. I think he's an amazing guitar player. I love the Butthole Surfers. And, you know, Paul Leary has been one of those boys on his knees, you know, screaming about Teenage Jesus and Beirut Slump, quoting their lyrics, blah, blah. Oh, it changed my life, blah, blah. I'm like, and I had told Paul Leary I would get a hold of him eventually, but when I did, he said he wanted to just sit on his ass and wait for the checks to roll in. So then I contacted my friend Chris Connolly, um, who had played in ministry and, and various other bands out of Chicago. I, didn't, I knew he wasn't the right guitar player, but maybe he had some advice. And I don't know if it was him at the same time or Weasel actually volunteered. He heard the word was out. And it was very cute because he sent me a, an email saying, I play guitar too. I had seen him play drums. He goes, just ask Thurwell. He saw me. And so I you know, asked Thurwell. I asked Chris Connolly. I'm like, oh, I know he's an amazing fucking drummer. And I was like, all right, good. Yeah. So I, I, we talked. And I'm like, all right. I mean, I, I knew he was in no way fanatic. So um, that was, he, it was the perfect solution because really absolutely no one could replace what he does, because he understands the music much better than just about anybody. He understands it from a, not only a musical perspective, which is skewered, but he understands it, as he was just saying, from a deeper perspective. He understands that the music is the vehicle for what needs to be done, what I need to do. Um, when we were listening to the record we just recorded in the car the other day, which was very emotional to me because, well, I was tired and it was just emotional because I'm, I'm, it's just the way the music should be played. You know, a lot of times when doing these concepts, I mean, we would record before we ever played live a lot of times. And the music changes once you play live. Um, and the document was the most important thing. But hearing all of the collection of songs, and Weasel chose a lot of the new songs that we're doing. They're not new, they're new old songs that we're doing. And... Um, you know, they're very emotional songs for me. I mean, a lot of them are from, I mean, I've had many dark periods. My music is dark. And he, he quoted me and he said, you know, well, you did, in limbo, you did want to make the most depressing record uh, ever made. I'm like, well, I guess I succeeded. Um, and, you know, playing some of those songs now, I mean, it's very emotionally racking for me because even though I'm not in that place now, a big part of, you know, my trauma zone is still wounded in that way, you know. There are other zones which take precedent in my daily life. They have to, otherwise, you know, it'd just be too morose. But I mean, I had to go to those dark places because I'm not the only one in them. And cause that was the state I was in. And, uh, you know, the amount of lyrics that deal with physical discomfort and, you know, death and tragedy, I mean, it's just a roadmap to um, 
you know, the emotional universe that I do feel it is my duty to explore and to, and to, to speak for other people, you know, who, who have suffered similar afflictions. Um, so when, you know, people paint their little picture of me, however they want to paint it, you know, the, the, the naysayers, the snarkers, you know, that they don't get me does not offend me. It actually brings me great joy. Um, I've always taken a lot of satisfaction in knowing that so much of what I do is over, I'm not saying that it's over people's heads, but for instance, spoken word like last night, I know that there are images embedded in those lyrics that you are gonna stick in your head and you're gonna not hear what I'm saying in the next, that is my orgasm. That is my artistic high point. Now, it's not the same image every time for everybody, but I know I am, parlaying images that are gonna freeze your brain for that moment, and that's transcendence then, because you're lost. That's where I wanna be when I see music. I wanna be disappeared. I wanna get out of myself and go someplace else. I wanna go to this other zone. Again, that is the religion. You know, I have goosebumps just talking about it. He's taken me there in his music. I once I saw a show with, with Weasel Walter, and is it Jack Blum? John. John Blum, who's an amazing, he plays the piano like a cross between Cecil Taylor and a jackhammer. And I saw a performance, it was me, 20 bearded fat guys in flannel shirts, and um, Weasel and John Blum at this shitty place in Brooklyn. I wanted to get up and dance wildly like some psychedelic 60s freak out, but I, I was already enough of a spectacle just by being there. But this particular concert, for some reason, I mean, I literally blacked out three times. Like, I just, I, I was out of, I was not here. So, there's no words. I don't always need, I never listen to, to music that has words because there's enough voices in my own head, but this music, that's what music is supposed to do. You know, that's actually what some psychedelia did because it was so, it was so weird and complex and, and long and hypnotic that that's why it was, you know, at the time, acid and psychedelic music made a lot of sense because you wanted to get out of your mind. You wanted to get out of your body. Um, you know, uh, I live very much in my body. So I want things to take me out of that or take me really so deep inside it that I can have cellular change. That's a really hard order mm -hmm. to summon. But as a full-blown hedonist, you find methods. <laughs> when you embrace pleasure as I do, you will find a way to disappear into another zone where nothing exists except for the absolute ultimate rebellion, which is pleasure. That was the punchline of what I was saying last night. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um. Yeah, and what, well, we were kind of just talking about it off camera, too. Um, what's different about you, too, in a really positive way, is that, um, you know, you said you would rather play a show like this than play for, like, a thousand people. Ah. And, it's, and that's just been, like, this steady, oh, my God, what's really funny is I think we were talking about it the other day, is, like, in the 70s, People talk about teenage Jesus, and they talk about you in the 70s and 80s. Like when there were 20 people at my that, shows. Yeah, and that I mean that festival um, when the Eno Comp came out. Right. There was like a a no wave festival yeah. or something, right? And you said there were like 30 people there yeah. in some interview. Yeah. So I mean, retrospectively. Well, I mean, I can I consider myself a salon artist. I mean, when I think of, you know, when I go back to. You know, one of my ultimate, I mean, I, I, my favorite performances are in a living room, usually one-on-one, -on -one, but however, I love a living room with 30 people. I love to do house readings. I love, that was the perfect size audience for me last night. I don't, why more? I mean, I want to be able to look into, you see I'm looking in people's eyes. Yeah. I'm touching them. I mean, I'm doing a very intimate thing. I want it to be an intimate experience. That's why people come to me. That's why they come to me. That's why I want them to come to me. And if you can't handle this kind of intimacy, just check the fuck out. And that's why a lot of macho dudes cannot handle it. Because they don't want to go that deep or that hard or that soft. Mm -hmm. They don't want to go there. And that's why the sensitive boys come. And that's why the hard girls come. Because yeah. they need somebody to reach inside to that gooey center, which I know where it is. Um, do you still put out your own records, that you started your own? Well, yeah, I did widow speak, but I mean, that was just a way of, of using various distribution companies to keep my catalog alive for a while. But right now, you know, so much is on download, which I'm happy for. I never started doing this because I thought I was gonna sell records. I mean, A, I can't believe I'm still doing it. Mm -hmm. And you know, that I'm still doing it. Okay, my fan base has not expanded very much. I just go to more cities than I used to. I mean, you see, this is 37 years later. I have, what, 100 people? Thank you. 
that's all I need at a show. Yeah. Um, I didn't start doing this to be popular. I didn't start doing this because I thought I was going to sell records. I'm happy people can find my shit on YouTube and download it. Um, but right now, I did. I cut back the back catalog because there's just no need to have all that physical stuff. I'm going to do a Bandcamp thing and put a lot of the stuff on there because people, if they want it, they can yeah. come to it. But having the actual physical thing is so outdated now. You know, I want people who. You know, I want somebody who's like lonely and sitting in Bucharest and read about me in some article or saw Angry Women or whatever or heard the Sonic Youth Death Valley 16. I want them to have access to my stuff. If they come to me, I want them to be able to, to, to get as much as possible. That's why it's important for me that I've been doing this, co compiling my archives, because I want it someplace safe and digitalized now so that it's not left, that burden is not left because I'm not planning on dying tomorrow, but it's a possibility we all have to face. I just want to be prepared, because I don't want to leave that shit for somebody else to clean up. And I, and I, I, I mean, I've always thought it was important. I am the one shitting in the face of history. That's how I view what I do, and that shit must be done. And it has been, and I have documented it, and I don't know who's gonna be the bearer of, all the, of the burden of the weight of that, but I didn't do it, be, I did it because I thought it was, imp it was going to be important to some people. And when somebody tells me at 13, at 14, at 15, at 16, I found whatever they found, and they come to me, and I don't expect everyone to know the breadth of what I've done. I mean, the thing is, why I feel I'm the most successful artist has nothing to do with my bank account. I've been homeless so many times in my adult life. Right now, I'm nomadic. I'm not, you know, whatever. If the price of being true to my nature is to be nomadic and to be homeless and to be fucking poor, well, so many of my heroes have had to live the same life, and I am willing to take that chance, because there will always be someone that will, will help you. I figure they should, because I hope that's what I've been doing. That's why I do what I do, because I know it helps people. It's not, it's a very, it's not like it's, it has nothing to do with the details of my personal trauma. That's irrelevant. Everybody has details. People have many worse details than my life is embodied, but I have to speak for them. Because I understand that wound, and I know that pain is the universal emotion, and this world is in too much fucking pain. So if I come off aggressive and, and using the enemy's language in an aggressive way, well, the people that are really wounded are not afraid of me. I am not the bully. I am bullying the bullies. And anyone that knows what I do knows that is what I do. I'm not there to bully you. You know, if you think I'm bullying you, it's because you can't fucking stand up to be who you are. Women are never afraid of me. Or they might be afraid, but they still come. Mm -hmm. And, and it really, I think it's a lot of it is with sexual segregation. You know, don't show your emotions. Be a man. Be tough. We got to get rid of that bullshit. Yeah. You know, and boys are really fucking bullied. And I really, I mean, that's why I'm very, that's why, you know, I started a photo series of 12 to 16 year old boys because I wanted to go in and show them who they were and say, look, this is you. This is you. You do not have to conform. This is who you are. And it was pretty effective. You know, and I have a series called All My Heroes Are Killers because I don't want those boys to become killers. It was interesting, I just ran into two, two, two beautiful blondes in a cafe and I'm like, God, you guys are great. Are you twins? Yeah. Are you actors? Yeah. What's your name? I photographed them and they're 10 years old in Aja Argenta's film. Dylan and Cole Strauss became Disney stars. And I'm like, here's the pictures. I had them in my computer. They're like, wow. Oh, I think I know who you're talking about. They're amazing. One's now a poet. I have a photo of him at 10 writing in his notebook on a curb. Oh, yeah. And the other's an archaeologist. And just even taking their pictures when they were 10, we just spent a few weeks together. You know, whatever they picked up from me then. And now they, they come back into my life, because I just, I saw them, I had to know who they were. I get back in their life, and that's important. Mm -hmm. You know, I like it when people, they, however they find out about me. You know, I think that if I can get into them when they're 14 to 16, that's gonna do something. I want it to do something, because that's when I needed help, and literature did that. Yeah, I think you said that in your, your piece last night, too. That's probably the, the one I remember the most. Yeah. Um, well, I mean, I know we have to end soon. I read something about, uh, when did you move to Spain? Because you don't actually, you said you're... Yeah. At this point. Yeah, yeah. yeah, but I moved to Spain about eight years ago. And I moved, I actually, no, it has to be a little longer than that because I moved when Bush stole the second election. Okay. I'm like, that's it, I'm out of here. Yeah. Um, and also, I mean, I had, been, uh, I had been kind of scanning the planet. I was in L.A. for four years. I went out to L.A. to work with Hubert Selby before he died again, just spent any time with him and Jerry Stahl, uh, the writer. We did, we did some touring together. He's one of my favorite writers and performers, actually, Permanent Midnight, his book. Um, so I went out there to work with uh, 
Hubert Salby, do a few more shows with um, him and, and, and Jerry Stahl. Did my Anubian Lights project, and uh, and then I was kind of done with LA. Did you know? Did a few other things, and I was just kind of scanning and like, why am I living in LA when I make most of my money or could do most of my performances in Europe? I have more freedom to do any kind of performance there. It's easier to find places. Um, so I just I had been going to Spain since 1984. And I go, and the first minute I got there, I said, I'm gonna live here someday. I just knew it. I mean, the minute I stepped off, I'm like, I'm gonna live here someday. Part of it is the architecture. That gives me great solace. Um, part of it was the, the brutality of its history juxtaposed with the, it, its artistic creations. You know, I mean, just the art from Goya to Dali to, to Gaudi and, and so many other things, how supportive they are of arts now. Um, the attitude of the people, very important, because being someone that focuses on so much negativity, being what I call the liver of America, that uh, to be in a place where people are just, they enjoy life. When you see groups of teenagers, they're like all happy and kissing. When you see children, they're like worship, like little kings and queens. That makes very healthy adults, yeah. unlike most everybody I know in America. Um, the attitude of the people was very important. There's no aggro. So being someone who's like <laughs> very agrocentric, um, you know, the contradictions of everything it is. There are 3,000 ghost towns. A lot of the, st the footage from last night is from the ghost towns. There were just many things to draw me there. And also, I just needed to, to de-louse. So, and then I, I had this photograph on my wall that I had for 20 years, and it was a black and white portrait with a gun to a man's head that said, you win or you lose. And it was a photographer who I've known for, who I knew for 20 years. I'm like, I've been staring at this fucking picture for 20 years. Maybe I should just stare at the man himself. Yeah. So I kind of stalked him. He was ready. So we, so I moved there and we did, we did some collaborations. We did photographic collaborations. And, um, and it was just a very good period for me to really de-stress and still then be able to do other kinds of, of work in Europe which is what supports me for the most part. Yeah, and you said it's easier for you to make a living there, you don't? I can't support myself in this country. I, I, I never could, I never did. I mean, well, I think one of the smartest things I ever did was give hand jobs under a table to take Teenage Jesus to England in 1977. I was gonna bring <laughs> that up, but I'm like, I don't think it. Well, you know, you do what you gotta do. We all worked in the sex yeah. industry in the 70s, no biggie. I mean, it was only a hand job under the table, for God's sake, come on, it got the band of Europe. Well, you actually said. I'm not ashamed to admit it. Hey, I was just I was just wondering if I could give two at a time now to get yeah. the band, you know, back to Europe. I don't know. I'm 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 really skilled now. I don't know. Yeah, it was this actual quote I read, and you're like, I just suck a little dick because I wanted to get the band to Europe. What whatever, you know, big deal. Hello. No, but a lot of yeah, yeah, yeah. You know what I'm saying? That, but, but I've never read. Yeah, no, you never heard anybody put. <laughs> Look, art is more important than a little bit of yeah. dick looking every now and then. At least I wasn't sucking corporate cock. Although, you know, the enemy's money is as good as a friend's money, in my opinion. But. Look, but that was the smartest thing I ever did was to get Teenage Jesus to, to England. And we almost didn't get in the country. We didn't know anything. We didn't know that you needed work papers. We had to say, I, we had to like pull the alligator chairs. We had to bring our guitars. We were afraid somebody would steal them. And finally, after hours, they let us in because I'm that good a con artist. They could have sent us back. We did some gigs. I, mean, I don't know who saw them. But it was important because after that, I just kept going back and going back and tried to bring everything I could to Europe. And a lot of my contemporaries did not do that. So therefore, their career, I mean, th th I just knew I had to go there. Um, and I just kept going. And, and, and then Pete, there were different kinds of invitations. And they would take just whatever wacky shit I was doing at the time. So, you know, it just made sense. And there was no reason to live on the west coast of America when I'd have to go to Europe to make money. I mean, there was just no point. So, I mean, now I've, but it was the longest I've ever lived in one city or one, one apartment, eight years. Usually two or four years I move. It's just the nature, you know, I move for different reasons. Economy, architecture, collaborators, sick of the place. Want to go someplace I don't know anybody. Mm -hmm. um, I like doing that. Uh, you know, I always feel like I'm outside of everything, no matter where I am. So I don't speak Catalan, I don't speak Spanish, I refuse to speak the language because I don't want to hear what everybody's saying. People think that's really arrogant. I'm like, no, it's self-protective. I don't want to hate these people too <laughs> because they're banal conversations. I want to li listen to it like music. Um, 
Yeah, so I mean, it's really served its purpose, but now in mean, the last two years have been rather nomadic, and uh, and part of it is a rebellion against being for one in one city in one apartment for eight years. Which the four year mark, I was just I was having a neurological itch that was just, literally eczema was forming. <laughs> I'm like, oh, I gotta get out of here. But um, I wanted to to stop my own patterning, so I said, okay, I'm not going to do that this time. All right, so it's the normal two to four year itch. No. Um, I don't know if that was a wise move or not, but here I am now anyway, so it doesn't really fucking matter. Yeah. No, I read that about um, relationships, too. Like, you move a lot, and then also relationships. Well, they have, like there's a natural more. chemical reaction that, I mean, if you want to be scientific about it, I mean, that does take all the romance out of romance, but if you want to look at it from a neurological point of view, which I do, as someone who talks to her cells all the time. I mean, there are chemical reactions that happen and they do have patterns and they do last for a certain amount of time. It's like the same way that a drug has a, like, you know, you do ecstasy, you know, it's going to last for about eight hours. You smoke a joint, you might be high for two, depending now, it could be four hours. But like any drug, love is a drug. And, um, you know, unless you really know how to finesse and sometimes in advance, you know what the, what the span of that is. I mean, I did. I often knew what the span of a relationship was. There was no insult to that person. I was quite honest. I'm like, I'm going to be here for two years. Let's, this is going to be great. So let's make the most of it. What's wrong with that? If you know and you're honest, of course it's heartbreaking. But what do you get in those two years is, is glory without any bullshit. You know, and there are different trajectories. I mean, I'm not an expert in this stuff, but I only know from my own patterning. I mean, I've studied my own patterning. And I know there are two four and seven year patterns, and then there are some things that defy that pattern because they start somewhere else. So, I mean, I think that people are really fucked up in relationships for a few reasons. One, they're always looking for the perfect person to solve all of their issues, which they came with fully loaded, which is I always felt as a responsibility you should not burden someone with. That's why I used to have six boyfriends at once. Like, you want to just <laughs> spread, the, spread the trauma over a vast terrain and maybe nobody will get hurt. Of course, they all did, but not really. They didn't. Actually, when I had six boyfriends at once, everybody was having, really a, had six everybody was having a good damn time, except the man I was living with he wasn't too happy but oh well <laughs> sorry really I was terribly sorry about that um for me I just didn't feel it should be any one person's responsibility to bear the burden of who I am and I don't think that's a selfish thing I think it's a generous thing mm -hmm. you know I just felt it's not fair and that's the opposite of how we're fucking brought up we're trained oh yeah Mr. Right no bullshit Mr. Right what about a dozen Mr. Wrongs? How does that feel? That could be good for a short period of time. You know what I'm saying? Mr. Wrong. How much of a burden is that to place on any one person? Yeah. That they're going to solve your problems, fill all your needs, understand your desires, correct that traumatized person. That's not fair. It's not fair. That's sleepless in Seattle. Yeah. <laughs> Well, that's why I guess I never sleep. <laughs> that's why I guess I do four hours a night. I got shit to do. But I mean, you know, not every, it, it, I just think that we are inbred with so many uh, emotional handicaps that, that lead to a disappointing reality. And I think that's why it's, it's, for me, it's always important to say with women that we have to regain pleasure because it is the first thing they steal from us. Don't do that. Be a good girl. Smile, act nice. Don't be a great, bull fucking shit. Be who you are and know what you want and then get it. Why not? Why not? You know, can't we just be honest about things? I mean, you know, and I think that's the downfall of a lot of relationships. People just find it really hard to be really honest. Yeah. And it's not always because they don't want to spare the other person. It's because they're too embarrassed to admit. And that's also, that's, that's terrible, you know. Um, I do, as a performer, I'm just, um, and I read somewhere, I don't remember where I read it, um, that you actually need a lot of solitude and quiet. Yeah, and oh, I, I never listen to music. Yeah. I hardly ever listen to music. That's surprising. I, I do like to be alone. I mean, I have to pretty much sleep alone. It's very hard for me because I don't sleep much. It's like, yeah. I, I, I call it the Goldilocks effect. <laughs> like, I need yeah. three or four beds, you can wander from one to the other. Um, I like quiet. Um, I wouldn't call it meditation what I do because I don't prescribe to anyone, but I, I have to vegetate. Mm -hmm. People don't believe that. I say, oh, I am the laziest girl in town. I'm like, oh, right. But the thing is, I have to be really lazy in order to have the energy I do to do what I do. And sometimes it may appear as a vegetative state, but I mean, 
the, the other things are being repaired. Just because I'm quiet, I'm not watching TV, I don't have the radio on, I'm not listening to music. It's like all that shit is just distraction to me. That, that's, get, that's, that's distracting from what really has to go on. I have to do a lot of reparation, you know, and sometimes that just means lying down quietly by yourself <laughs> and not reading and, and just emptying out the premises as I consider this a hotel where many monsters live, sometimes I just have to tell them to all go away for a while, there's no one to play with. And that's good, I have to do that. Um, it's very therapeutic, I think, and you know, you know the quote, the hardest thing for, for, for people to do is to sit in a room alone with themselves quietly and do nothing. Well, not for, oh, well, this is my mastery, very zen. I don't even consider it that, but I think it's part of why I have the constitution I have. You know, because I can sit quietly alone and I don't need to fill every minute with distraction. I need to just decompress. It's not even meditative, because it's just an emptying out. You know, I mean, I'm, I'm, high, I'm, I'm completely over-emotional, over-sensitive. I mean, I appear this, you know, yeah, I'm fucking tough, but I am extremely wounded by everything that happens in the world. I mean, I am extremely wounded by man's stupidity, by his selfishness, by his greed, by the brutality that has no end. And at the same time, I have to embrace it because again, the patriarchy is full of shit. It's stupid, it's homicidal, it's genocidal, it's greedy, it's selfish. Oh, really? No kidding. Yeah. It has to change. It's funny because I was just invented a new character yesterday. I was like, Farrah Kant. I heard about that, yeah. And because I, I mean, one of my big mantras used to be, it has to be the end of the white man's revolution. It has to be the end. It has to be the end. And this is just not working. It has not worked for, for hundreds, if not thousands of years. Yeah. So I will continue to scream into the face of that which is wrong, of that which is abusive, and of that which there is no justice in, and that is this fucking world as we know it now. So therefore, I guess I will always just keep talking. <laughs> All right, and um, yes, yeah, so you have your show tonight, um, and we'll see. I'll see you on the fifteenth. Of He's course, like, can't wait. Yeah, so if there's like, we are conspiring about I this. No, I, I really am. I mean, look, I, I do what I do because you need to hear it. I do what I do because there are some people that just. For some reason, whatever it is, whatever they found that I do, mattered to them somehow. Told them something, showed them something that they needed to hear at that moment. That's why I continue to do it, you know? Otherwise, look, I can be in my own living room giving a private performances one-on-one. -on -one. I'm very good at that, darling. Oh, yeah. <laughs> As a matter of fact, I might have to auction those off soon. That could be a good idea, you see? Oh, yeah? Why not? Who knows, private performance. How much would I put on that, though? See, that's, that's the issue. I can't really decide how. We'll talk about that later. I'll get you a pack of cigarettes. The... <laughs> oh, you think I'm a cheap date, honey? <laughs> It'll start with a pack of cigarettes and end with a pound of no, flesh. I'm Holy sure. kitty. <laughs> oh, my God, I didn't say that. Um, I do what I do, and I will continue to do what I do, because there are people who have been battered by reality and that, that need not necessarily a safe place, but that need someone to say those words to them that they can hear late at night that are maybe gonna give them that one breath they can take. That's the deepest breath they ever had. That's all. I wanna give people breath. One more to go on. Thank you. Thank you, Lydia.